Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Sebastian. Um, I'm responsible for Google up here in Canada. Um, we do lots of meetings in this room. We have lots of all hands, but this is the coolest, hippest crowd I think we've ever had. So, um, in fact, you know what? I'm just going to take a picture to prove to my wife how cool I am. Uh, this is awesome. Everyone say hello. All right, cool. So thanks um, for coming tonight. We're honored to be able to host the event. Uh, we've worked very closely with the mayor's office on a handful of initiatives over the last couple of years, uh, but this is a really cool one. Um, for those who don't know much about Google here in Canada, we've been here for about uh, 14 years. Google's 18 years old, uh, but one of our first international offices was in Toronto, and we've built up uh, the business over time. We're about 1,000 Googlers across Canada in four different offices. Uh, and we've got a big presence here in Toronto. And we just built this facility uh, on this floor about a year and a half ago for, for this exact reason, uh, especially on the business side, not the engineering, but the business side of Google. We're all about partnerships and trying to make lots of different connections. And tonight's a great example of that. So um, I'll, I'll get off the stage and, and just uh, enjoy all of you. Enjoy this evening. Have a great time. Uh, and, and Mayor, um, take over. Well, Sam and the friends, first of all, I want to say thank you to Sam and to Google uh, for having us all here. Um, you've noticed the wine and the beer and everything. I think that goes on here every day as far as I know. <laughs> and so if you want to just come by here, actually, even if there's not an event on, just come on by and have a glass of wine or a beer and uh, everything will be in good shape. But uh, I want to say thank you to Sam and Google in all seriousness. And also thank you to the resource people you'll be hearing from uh, tonight and to thank you uh, for coming because this obviously wouldn't work if either of those two groups of people uh, didn't show up. Um, this is an important thing for me uh, personally as the mayor, and I think it's an important thing for the city. You'll be happy to hear that when I uh, represent the city um, in Canada and outside of Canada, uh, that I end up talking about music and the arts a lot, uh, because I think that one of the things that separates uh, Toronto from uh, other cities is that we have such a lively uh, arts and cultural scene here, including uh, music. Um, and um, it is, uh, because it's an important business, I mean, with all the artists and the promoters and all the different people, producers, and all the people that are involved in a business, you know better than I. Uh, but I also mention it because I know that our success in bringing jobs and investment here, uh, new jobs and investment, is very much contingent upon the livability of the city um, and what people think of the city in terms of the sort of tone and, and, and how you feel, the environment when you get here. And I know that um, the arts and music uh, have as much to do with that as, frankly, tax rates or other things like that that are more mundane that people will raise from time to time. We've seen in place after place, and I learned when I went to Austin, and I, I went there and I saw, of course, South by Southwest, but I also went to see some of the big employers there, including uh, Google, but also including IBM and others, and I said, how big a factor was your decision to come here and create jobs? How big a factor was the music scene in Austin? And they said it was a big factor because it related to the kind of people that they knew they wanted to hire were more likely to be um, in Austin because of the music and, and vice versa. I mean, it was kind of one of those things where those, uh, those things both fed on themselves. Um, as the mayor, I had said that I wanted to try and make Toronto Music City. I think we already were, but it was meant to be an aspirational thing to sort of say, look, among all the different cities, even those in Canada that declare themselves to be Music City, we wanted to make sure we really achieved it, not for bragging rights, but because we thought it was going to be so uh, beneficial to us. And so there's probably two aspects to the job that I'm trying to do now. One is trying to be a champion um, for our music scene, which I'm learning every day. And I don't know that much about the music scene. I have a son who went to music school and works for Live Nation, and so he keeps me as informed as any much older uh, man could be. But having said all that, um, I just know we have something here that's very special when it comes to everything from the artists uh, through to the venues, through to um, the promoters, the production piece, uh, and so on. And I've been trying to do this, as I say, both here at home uh, and abroad. But the second and more important role, in a way, I guess, is to be what I call a facilitator. Um, you know, there's not much I can do to sort of issue decrees. In my job, there aren't many decrees to be issued. But you can facilitate uh, things and help make them happen. And I've been making a big effort with that, too, uh, with the help of very capable uh, public servants who are here, uh, Mike Tanner, Zabe Shake, of course, and all of the group that are working on uh, music at the City of Toronto. It's a small but mighty uh, group, and we're doing it uh, by liberalizing our permit rules, for example, that uh, now make a greater, a much greater allowance for um, live music to be in parks and and, and uh, ease up on some of those restrictions before that said unless somehow you were a charity, you couldn't be there. 
And so that's made it easier. And in fact, I think it resulted in about uh, 30 different groups, music organizations this past year alone, the first year, uh, who were able to perform in parks uh, who and, and be there uh, who weren't able to be there before. Um, it's a small thing, but people who call, and I hope they don't sit on hold for too long at the 311 phone number, which is where you phone if you have any problem with the city or want information, they now hear Toronto artists performing continuously on that phone line when they're sitting there. It's just a small way in which we can expose um, our great Toronto artists. Uh, we've published a Toronto music directory for the first time, and you can see it online, and it's something that has, it's a great resource to have uh, for people, obviously, in the business. Uh, and we're actively at work trying to ensure fair treatment for existing venues because we hear first when some of them are under pressure uh, from uh, neighbours who may not uh, accept, accept or understand readily what's going on at some of those places that have been there for a long time. And we're also making sure that the music industry is at the table uh, when it comes to a new, a new noise bylaw. And these all sound, some of them, like pretty mundane things, but I think they're very important ultimately to the ability of this uh, industry and this scene uh, to, to thrive. A lot of this comes out of the strategy paper put together by our Music Advisory Committee, and I want to thank them too. There's a broad range of very capable, accomplished people who agreed to serve on this Music Advisory Committee, which was set up when we decided to sort of aspire to be a uh, music city uh, in Canada. And we're trying to follow a lot of the recommendations uh, they made to us, and that's really uh, why we're here tonight. One of the thrusts that they said uh, to us in, in their work was that a lot of smaller uh, music organizations, music industry players, musicians, uh, want to be able to put on world-class events, but a lot of people who are kind of more on their own, more independent, smaller, don't have access to the places where there are money and sponsorships available that can help to make an event, you know, m aspire to be uh, bigger uh, and better. And so what we've done tonight is simply answered that by bringing together uh, independent music event promoters, smaller independent music organizations, um, to listen to and hopefully hook up with uh, some of the major people who have, have uh, had a history of sponsoring uh, in the music area. And I think that's going to be part of uh, tonight is going to be about sort of listening and uh, absorbing information, but part of it as well, there's lots of time later on to discuss at the tables and also to uh, network uh, at the reception to follow. And I'm hopeful, of course, that uh, new relationships will be established uh, out of this uh, and that uh, that will support musicians and music events and confer uh, even more legitimacy on the music strategy that we've been working on for the last uh, period of time uh, since I uh, took this office. I really believe that our prospects, and just sitting in the room tonight with some of the people you're going to hear from very shortly, and I'm hearing about the buzz that's being created way outside of the city about our musicians and, and our music scene here, and people um, know who these artists are much more so than they did a year, two years, five years ago. And that's got to be the objective at the end of the day. It's about the artists, and it's, a, and it's about what goes on back here to support um, those artists. And we've got to keep boosting uh, that uh, reputation, and events like this are a part of that. And so I want to uh, thank um, our city team who have worked hard to put this on in cooperation with uh, all of the different uh, players and including my own staff, Amara from my office has uh, taken a keen interest in this and really sort of has grabbed it and, and run with it and I think that's uh, terrific as well. And enough from me, um, it is now my pleasure to begin introducing to you the first of the people that you're going to hear from uh, before we hear from the panel group and the first person we're going to hear uh, up here is Mark Harrison. Um, he's the founder and chair of the Canadian uh, Sponsorship Forum Experience and president and founder of T1. He's worked with some of the world's top brands uh, developing uh, marketing and sponsorship strategies and award-winning activations. And he's going to give us, just to start off the discussion this tonight, um, a, an overview of the sort of music sponsorship landscape uh, in Canada. So come on up, Mark, please. There you go. Thank you very much, Mayor Tory, and thank you, Google, for hosting us this evening. I think everybody in this room owes Mayor Tory, you know, their gratitude for helping make Toronto an international music city. And evenings like tonight are incredibly important, as you mentioned, an opportunity to talk about corporate sponsorship between brands, agencies, promoters, venues, and artists. If we're going to do this together, we have to think about how do we get together and listen. I am pretty sure that people in the music business have some of the best ears in the world. Well, not just in music, but also in commerce. Listening is a key skill. I want you tonight to listen to the panelists, not just the words they have, but what are the messages? What are the themes that they are trying to share with you about how to get sponsorship, how to build partnerships, and how to build successful relationships? One of the things that is quite clear to us in this industry is that music right now is underrepresented in sponsorship. 
Sponsorship in Canada has been growing over the last 10 years at about plus 5 to 10 percent. Today, there is $2.5 billion spent in sponsorship rights fees and activations in this country. It's pro sports, amateur sports, festivals, and charities get the lion's share of the budgets. Music in Canada right now is only getting 2.2 percent of that $2.5 billion. Compare that to the United States, where they're getting about 6.5 percent, we are underrepresented by over three times in the music sector. So you need to listen tonight about how you can perform for sponsors. We live in an event-based society. Think of what goes on in this world. We were just talking a minute ago about 2017. Consumers are driven by events. They're driven by pop-up shops. They're driven by festivals. They're driven by sports events. The more we get connected to digital, the more we also gravitate to those live experiences, whether it's friends playing guitar or coming over for a party. Music has an incredible opportunity. In fact, from my perspective, I think many other sponsorship sectors have stolen the concept of the festival from the music industry and are profiting from it greatly. So one of the things we know from the sponsorship research that we do is that there's really some critical things you can do to get sponsors. And I want to talk briefly about them tonight. One, this is a people business. Don't think about calling a bank or an automobile company or a telco. Think about that person across the table from you. How can you help her do her job better? That's the number one thing you need to be thinking about when you go in and you talk to a potential sponsor. You are in helping people get promoted business. You're not necessarily in the music business. You are creative people. As this world automates and there's more software and platforms, the one thing that can never be automated in business is creativity. Use that to your advantage. Become an insider. Become somebody who provides information, can provide key tips, give people up-to-date info on what's happening in the music world. As well, there's large and small organizations here from a music standpoint. Just because somebody is sponsoring Live Nation doesn't necessarily mean they might want to sponsor your little festival. So think about where is the right organization for you to partner with. If I was talking to boxers or MMA, I'd talk about, you know, punching in your own weight class. Get the Canadian Business Profit 500 list on your computer today. There are 500 Canadian companies on that list who are all growing like mad making a ton of money, and quite frankly, I was at their conference a few weeks ago, and I asked, do you get hit up for sponsorship? No. When they want to do something to engage employees, engage new customers, engage B2B, people don't call them. People just call the brands that they see on the headlines. And just like a musician, you've got to work your way up in sponsorship. You just can't necessarily parachute and start at the top. And the third thing to think about is taking your time. The music industry, and I understand that there's always challenges with artists, but the reality of life is if you're an agency or a brand, you don't want to be rushed into a decision. So become that music partner that can provide a competitive advantage by taking your time. We run a conference every year called the Canadian Sponsorship Forum. And we have some amazing data that comes out of there. And I'll share some data points with you. Number one, more than half of the sponsorship spent in this country is not national. It's local. It's regional. Use that to your advantage. Number two, consumers want brands to sponsor things that they have a personal connection to. There is nothing more powerful in this world than personal connections to music. I've heard more people tell me about the concerts at the World Cup of Hockey than the hockey. I thought it was a hockey tournament, but I think it was actually just a big party. So I want you to think about those things tonight. Listen to your panelists. Listen to those great messages that are coming through, giving you an opportunity to perform. And I'd like to hand the stage back to Meritori and the panelists, and let's get ready to rock. Mark, thank you very much. I think that certainly gets us off to uh, with some good uh, food for thought. We've got a great uh, panel put together tonight, uh, people who are thought leaders in the music sponsorship uh, space, and the intention is they're going to share some of the best practices beyond what Mark just introduced uh, and help uh, you to be more successful when you're pitching uh, for various uh, projects that you have and issues that you have. And I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists and ask them to come up as they're introduced and uh, take their seats, and uh, then we'll get on with the discussion. Uh, first, Andrew Lindsay, and uh, he is the manager of music business development at Google Play Music. Uh, he's an executive with experience at multiple levels within the music industry, including recording artists, uh, label, marketing and sales, business development. So, Andrew, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Brian Smiley is the uh, cultural marketing manager at Red Bull Canada. There's a job for you. 
responsible for building and maintaining a strong network of artists and creative partners, and uh, recently championed the Red Bull Music Academy in Montreal, so we'll look forward to hearing about that. Brian, welcome. Hamida Sashadina is part of a team that oversees Toronto Dominions, a TDE's corporate giving and manages the company's donations in the area of music, and she's got the privilege of working with outstanding charities that are making a difference in Canada. So, Hamida, thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Andrew Roosterhouse also has a great job as Director of Budweiser, responsible for accelerating the momentum behind this global brand uh, in the Canadian market. I think he's doing a pretty good job by all the, uh, all the records, and he's got a clear focus on media uh, forward ideas, and he's changed uh, the approach to uh, music in Quebec, and he'll talk a little bit about some of that. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Kevin Campbell. Kevin's with Virgin Mobile, and he's brought the brand to life through uh, partnerships and sponsorships and national events and created uh, the member benefits program that's very popular with uh, their subscribers, and he's uh, initiated and led title sponsorships of large-scale music festivals, uh, including Oshiega and the Calgary Stampede. So, thank you all for being up here. <laughs> Andrew, I'm going to start with you uh, and just ask you if you could, uh, and I'm going to ask East Tribute to give sort of a brief, and a brief meaning kind of, a, you know, an elevator uh, version of, uh, of an answer to this question. And it's kind of, what is your mission and positioning statement, and how does this play into the music sponsorship space? So, how, you know, it's back to what we heard Mark say, which is about, um, you know, trying to make sure you're related not to people, but also to the mission of the uh, pools of money that they're responsible for. And maybe you could just, we can go down the, sure. down the uh, ranks here and get an answer to that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, broadly speaking, Google's mission statement is to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful for everyone. And I think if you sub in information for music and sub in useful for context, that's kind of where we position ourselves musically. We're uh, trying to find the right song at the right moment for the right person. And um, we think about what that looks like from a sponsorship, sponsorship standpoint. That's the sponsorship or partnership that we're looking for it provides the audience for that. So if we're looking for reach and audience, um, we're contextualizing music as the soundtrack to the person's life and putting it in front of as many people as we can. Brian? Well, with Red Bull, I think everyone's familiar with our primary slogan, Red Bull gives you wings. Um, from our standpoint, uh, what we're trying to do is give wings to artists and ideas. And where that really comes to life is through our partnerships. So we're looking to work closely with partners. We're looking to work closely with artists to bring ideas to life. And these are things that normally they wouldn't be capable of doing. Okay, Hamida. Um, so at TD, we're all about delivering comfort to our customers and our communities. And I'm sure you've heard our tagline, banking can be this comfortable um, and seen our big kind of comfy green chair that we have in all of our ads. Um, for us, music is just a natural extension of this concept of comfort. Uh, music brings people together. It's there with us in the best times of life when we want to celebrate or enjoy ourselves. It's also there in the worst times when we need to be comforted um, and we need help rising up again. It's there with us at every uh, emotion in between. I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but no pun intended for that one too. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say that that's really why we, we support it because it's just another way we can bring comfort to our customers and our communities. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, uh, Budweiser's a global brand. We just had a big acquisition with SCB Miller. And so as a, co as a global company, we want to put a, you know, Bud in an arm's reach of everyone in the world. Uh, so that's our dream. It sounds really, I, I worked on that for a while. But uh, <laughs> so what I say is put, an arm, put, put a Bud in arm's reach of, a, of great music. And why? Because music is, you know, happens in, uh, around the world. And it's a really important way for us to connect with our consumer. But most importantly, you know, beer belongs in music. Right, it's a very natural space. People enjoy music with a beer, so that's our sort of w contextualized way that we bring our global dream to life in music. And last but not least, Kevin. You ch I know. <laughs> I knew that. Um, well, I'm really lucky to be part of a uh, incredible global brand, um, Virgin, that has deep roots in the music industry, as everybody knows, with Virgin Festival, Virgin Radio, Virgin Records. So um, what we try to do at Virgin Mobile is carry that heritage and bring that to mobility. And what we've done, we've created a program, a key differentiator called Member Benefits, where we drive exclusive offers, deals, VIP experiences to our consumers called members. Um, and really what we look for is the scope and scale of a partner or a sponsor to help us bring that to life. 
um, and still pay homage to the Virgin brand. So we're really trying to bring the heritage and the ethos of Virgin to mobility. Um, and it's around the notions uh, that's centered around, you know, what has your phone done for you lately? Um, and simply for being with Virgin Mobile, you get to experience some of these great experiences in music. Uh, we have five key pillars, music, fashion, travel, food, entertainment. Um, music's obviously being a big one of them. We've done title sponsorships of Lady Gaga, Katy Perry. We've done music venue sponsorships. Um, and we've worked with a lot of organizations across Canada and in Toronto to help uh, bring our brand to life through Virgin Mobile. Brian, I heard you talking about uh, giving wings uh, to artists, and a lot of people might think an organization like yours was you know, way out of reach of the people in this room. They're never going to sort of be able to be associated with, get any help from, form a partnership with uh, Red Bull. Um, but maybe you could give some examples of instances where very grassroots artists or organizations have, in fact, in the music business or elsewhere, formed a partnership with you because it fit uh, what you were looking for and what they needed. Absolutely. Um, the one uh, that's sort of closest to my own heart and the one that... Uh, I'm the, certainly the most proud of as an orga organization is our Red Bull Sound Select program. And the core of Red Bull Sound Select is really to explore local music scenes. So it's in 15 markets in the States and just expanded into six new countries, but it's focused in Toronto. And the best part about that is we don't decide which bands we're gonna work with. We actually work with local curators. And those local curators are sort of established members of the community, uh, organizations, individuals, uh, it really doesn't matter, but they're the ones who tell us who the acts are we should be working with. And from that standpoint, the onward, the artist is right at the forefront of every decision we make, and we make those decisions collectively, the artist, the curator, and Red Bull. And all we do at that point is facilitate opportunities. So that could be performances, that could be studio time, um, that could be you know travel outside of the country to perform in different cities, but at the end of the day, it's, what mo it's what's moving those artists forward. And if we can do that as part of this bigger ecosystem, um, to represent Toronto, that's, you know, that's why we do it. So that's one where we really feel, or I really feel like we sort of touch a lot of grassroots um, and sort of, and we'll say grassroots, but it's really just the community, it's the city, it's the people who are really involved in music and it's certainly um, been our greatest opportunity. All right, we'll start here with Andrew and, and we'll skip over you to give you a chance to rest, but we'll just go down the line here and ask you, uh, you know, Mike Tanner made reference in the room before we came in here about, you know, how signs are not enough. Um, and, and, you know, I think there was a day when back in the sort of nascent days of sponsorship, it was enough. But, you know, when you're looking now and making the decisions you make, um, you know, obviously you're looking for much more than that. And you might just talk about the kind of things you're looking for that are going to make uh, somebody's, um, you know, pitch to you uh, beyond the content of what they're doing, as it were, uh, you know, what, what, or, uh, what you're going to expect from them, what you are looking for um, that's going to benefit you. Yeah, um, for us, it's um, you know it's finding the right consumer. So um, you know instead of just putting up uh, you know sponsoring in the traditional sense of putting a sign up, it's more about getting people to try our product. So we want to have an experiential, um, you know, something that allows people to get into our product, mess around with it a little bit, and then ultimately become a premium subscriber of ours for our for our music service. So any way we can do that, um, that provides the maximum amount of reach, and that can be recurrence or in just one event. Um, we just want to find the maximum amount of people that just can get into our service to try it out. Does that imply that, because people in this room, and I know this when you're talking about smaller enterprises, it's harder for them to have the resources at their disposal to kind of learn enough to know who your, what did you just call them, premium subscribers? Yeah. Are, uh, does it imply, though, they have to somehow have done that kind of homework uh, to know that sort of thing? Because no, I mean, that's have a chance it's to one of our objectives, right? So, okay. I mean, um, what we do have is uh, the ability to find new paths into new, uh, new music consumers. So if that's a smaller event, I mean, how can we make that recurring and not just leave it at a one-time opportunity, right? Um, so if it's smaller bands, smaller festivals, um, how do we make it, like, how do we help them increase their digital footprint? How do we find more audience for them that therefore will have more audience for us? Okay, Brian, you're still resting. I'll go to Hamida. Um, you know, more than signs, uh, what are you looking for when somebody comes in in terms of stuff they can do for you or stuff they're gonna pitch to you? Sure, so I'm, I'm sort of wearing two hats here today because uh, half of TD Music is, uh, is managed internally by the sponsorship department at TD and the other half is managed by community relations, which is my department. And so I'd say we look for slightly different uh, things. The sponsorship department, again, you know, we've said activation, that's huge for us. Um, you know, I think we all know that uh, signage, it doesn't really touch people's lives. So we're looking for ways that we 
we can get in there, engage, engage with uh, whether it's your festival goers or, or whoever might be there. Um, and in, in terms of community relations, we support a ton of programs, and especially youth programs in music. So it's really about how many youth we can touch and, and how big of an impact it is. So um, that, those are the, the types of conversations that we have and what we look for. Okay, Andrew, you're probably not as much into the youth market, however that's defined, but uh, we do have an on like to be. You're out. So what are you looking for uh, beyond the, the signage, as it were? Yeah, it might be the wrong time to say this, but I actually think we, we spend too much money in sponsorship today. Uh, and the reason why is because we, we're just buying these passive assets. And uh, I'm a huge believer in making our sponsorships work a lot harder. I mean, it's no surprise. The, the brand in the U.S., Canada, across the world has been built off of sport and sponsorship. But the world's evolving, right? So, you know, there's a great Simon Sinek uh, TED Talk where he talks about understand why you exist. And I think that's a good inspiration for people in this room. If, you know, why does your festival or event exist? And if there's brands that exist for the same purpose, there's probably a good synergy there because... Every brand, I'm sure, up here in this world is trying to create more meaningful connections. And putting a rink board or putting a sign in the baseball stadium, to be honest, is not going to create meaningful uh, connections. Budweiser doesn't have an awareness problem. So that's uh, what we're talking about now a lot more is how do we make our sponsorships more active? And that to be to find that, that's like how do you be a meaningful role in a sponsorship event, an activation, be there where a consumer says you're adding value as a brand versus just being silently in the background saying I'm here. And that's a really interesting point that, you know, I just I heard that. And, and if you think of all these brands all the way down, and we'll finish up with Kevin and then come back to Brian. But, but uh, you know, none of these companies need awareness raising particularly. They're all pretty well known, so a sign's not going to do it. Uh, so, Kevin, uh, beyond the signs, what are you looking for when you're I trying to tie it into your members? You know, I, I think it, I wouldn't want to diminish having a, a logo presence. I mean, if it was in the top ten list of things, I think it would be number ten. Um, you know, the, the, the Virgin brand was, was built on spectacle and experience. Um, and what we try to look for with our partners is, you know, there's only a limited amount of assets within, within each of these spaces. And it's becoming a very crowded and diluted space, music sponsorship. So what we typically look for is something different. Um, um, a partner that's open to creating a whiteboard coming in and come up with new ideas that can really drive home what it means to be with Virgin Mobile, something that's different, experiential, um, a unique experience. We also look for content capture in most of our, our uh, partnerships and sponsorships now. Um, and somebody who would value um, you know, the opportunity to be with a company like ours. You know, at a push of a button, we have the ability to communicate the partner's goals. Um, through a very active national mobile base. So that becomes incredibly powerful uh, if you get to speak to the right people who understand that. So um, I guess what I'm saying is we look for a true partnership and try to redefine what happens in the amount of those limited assets in, inside the, the music sponsorship space. I'm going to skip. I'm going to stick with you for a minute because one of the questions that comes up a little bit later on, but um, it's probably a good time on that note to ask about it now and maybe start with you, uh, Kevin, which is what is the difference between a partnership uh, a sponsorship and philanthropy, because I think again, it's uh, you know a lot of you are approached on all three of those, um, and if you're looking for that partnership, um, what's going to sort of be what are going to be the elements that say it's a partnership as opposed to a, a charity, for example? Well, I, I think for us. Um you know, like I said, a partnership is really getting um, a party at the table that understands the value and kind exchange. Um, you know, everybody has a handset today. So the ability to partner with a company like ours and, like I said, to communicate the partner's message is, in is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, and often that may not be centered around a financial investment alone. Um, because there is a certain value and kind exchange. You know, we also have over 2,000 points of national distribution. Um, you know, we are part of a, a, a broader uh, big entity that has a, an incredible media division. Um, so there's lots of things we can do to bring to a partnership. I think in sponsorship alone, more often than not, folks are just looking for money. Um, and once the partner or sponsor request takes the, the funding and secures the investment, then that's, you know, more often than not, usually where it ends and they go on to the next one. Um, philanthropy, I mean, we're also part of a brand that has um, a global charitable arm called Virgin Unite. Um, and actually, there's a, an event down the street at this moment with Richard Branson um, as part of a Virgin Unite event in our regeneration program, which uh, supports at-risk youth. Um, so philanthropy, I think, maybe is involved around less so about the financial investment and more so about the message. 
A little hurt I wasn't invited to that, Kevin, but uh, I'll, I'll get over it. I'll get over Angie. it. Angie. Uh, Hamida, can we come to she you on that? She said you were. No. TD, again, does, uh, you know, does a lot of charity, uh, you know, charitable philanthropic giving, uh, does a lot of sponsorships, and, um, and you have partnerships. Uh, but, you know, when, you're, when it's music, um, what, what's going to be the difference, that, and, and, you know, what are you looking for? Uh, yeah. So uh, in, in the sponsorship realm, the brand sponsorship team, they support nine uh, major jazz festivals across the country, um, and they also support the Juno Awards. Um, and really what drives them is it's, pure, it's marketing, right? So it's uh, brand driving brand affinity. So things like we just talked about, activation, signage, ticket banks, uh, anything to kind of drive that brand choice and brand affinity. Uh, philanthropy, uh, philanthropy for us, you know, it's, it's in my department and community relations, and we have a slightly different focus. We do support about 70 uh, festivals across the country, but these are smaller scale, more grassroots festivals. Um, and beyond that, we support 100 uh, programs uh, that deliver music, uh, education, and access to youth. And our goal driving that is to really uh, support the, com the communities where we, we live, we live and work. Um, and partnership for us, it's, it's all of the organizations we work with um, because we work with all of them collaboratively to help further both of our aims. Um, and so we're, we're really constantly working with those groups. But our, our two departments of sponsorship and uh, community work very closely together because we found that we're, we're able to leverage our sponsorships and give some opportunities to community artists. Uh, that's really where the most impact happens. So right now, uh, we're a sponsor of the revitalization of Union Station. Um, and we've done some music series there and we've had some of our great uh, partners provide um, artists to, 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 to perform at Union Station. So I know We've got Honey Jam here today, Manifesto, um, Coalition, uh, Music. So all of these groups, they've had artists perform um, at Union Station in our series. And these are paid performances, so they get that platform to perform um, and, the, and those paid opportunities. And it enhances our sponsorship on the other side by providing those experiences. Just on that one, though, and I'm embarrassed to say, I was telling the guys in the front row here that you learn every day in my job and you do about something. And I had no idea, even though I'm the mayor that we had music going on at Union Station. Yep. H who, how did that idea come about? I mean, is that somebody brought that to you and sort of said, put this on, and then it kind of fleshed out from there? Or did you think it up and go find the artist? Because I think people would want to know if they had an idea like that. There's so many places you could do music in Toronto that are novel. You know, I mean, Union yep. Station's a novel place to do something like that. So how did that happen? So our sponsorship of Union Station is, is a really, it's a really interesting one, right? Because it's under construction. There are so many areas. It's changing every day where you can work, where you can't. Um, and so part of the reason and what Osmington, the company that's managing Union, um, believes in as well is bringing culture and, and our whole piece around comfort, delivering comfort to the commuters, commuters as the revitalization is ongoing. Um, that's just enhanced through music, we find, you know, creating these enjoyable experiences. So we've worked with them to create, I think, three music events so far. So the first was a block party, which, which launched our partnership. And we've also done um, the, the Union Summer Market outside. We programmed that stage. And then now we have every Friday Music Fridays um, there. So uh, there, there are opportunities, and the sky's the limit with what we're doing at Union Station. So there could be many, many more opportunities for that. All right. Unless uh, Andrew and Andrew and uh, Brian have an overwhelming desire to comment on that particular question of sponsorship versus philanthropy versus uh, a partnership, I'm going to go to a different question and start here with you, Andrew, and that is, uh, can you talk about um, the, your favorite music-driven partnership that you've had or project that, you know, was one that uh, with somebody else that, that worked really well or that was your favorite just because you, you know, found it, it sort of achieved what you were talking about in terms yeah. of premium subscribers and so on? Sure, yeah. Um, so probably, I think, the best one to look at for me for the last year, and I'm going to say this because I can see Alan Reed giving me the death stare at the back of the room, <laughs> is that... Uh, <laughs> um, have security take him out of here. <laughs> uh, we answer. did a partnership with the Juno Awards, and um, it checked a couple of boxes for us, and one, it gave us uh, some real reach as far as um, broadcast goes. Um, it associated 
Google, uh, Google Play Music operates in 62 countries around the world. So when we've got an ability to regionalize that and make it sp Canada specific, and by that extension working with the Juno Awards for Canada specific artists, um, then that's super important to us that um, it makes us a little more Canadian. And, um, and there was a Music Counts component to that. So people that came into trial, we made a donation to Music Counts for everybody that trialed our product. Um, so it checked off all three boxes for us. Uh, it was a really meaningful partnership um, that we're repeating again next year. So we're pretty excited. Excellent. Brian? Yeah, just, I would definitely go back to, to, I'll sound like a broken record, but again, Sound Select, just because of those, those local partnerships we had within that, um, like our curators, right from the start, Manifesto, Arts and Crafts, Wavelength, and North by Northeast, these are institutions here in Toronto. And um, their uh, ability, to, I guess it go, this goes back to your previous question about partnership, this, they really bought into like having a true partnership with the artist at the center here and with Red Bull kind of uh, behind the scenes. Um, and so it was very much mutual. Um, and all of the ideas and the concepts and the opportunities they provide for these artists and for us as, as a brand were you know, more than we could ever ask for. So that was really uh, fulfilling. Thank you. Amita? Um, I, we have tons of partners and they're all fantastic and doing such meaningful work. I'd say the one that comes to mind too is the Juno Awards and Music Counts. Um, we've been sponsoring the Juno Awards for many years, uh, but we, in 2013, we worked with uh, Music Counts to create the Music Counts TD Community Music Program that provides instruments to after school programs and organizations across the country. Um, and this past year, we were able to, for the first time, leverage uh, what's traditionally been a big part of our sponsorship, which is the broadcast segment, um, to tell that Music count story and to provide an opportunity to a young woman, Sam Spensley, who had um, been a beneficiary of one of the programs that we support through the Music Counts program, and she got to perform on stage with lights um, on the broadcast. So it was a great moment, and we were able to, again, leverage that that uh, sponsorship platform to tell the story and to provide uh, our, our applications for the Music Counts grants went way up after that. Um, and we got, gave this life-changing experience to this young woman. And it just, it does stand out in my mind as um, a great uh, a partnership as well as a, a great moment. Andrew? I'm gonna go Metallica, Quebec. <laughs> Metallica never partnered with an alcohol brand ever. Uh, there's obviously some story behind that for why, but the idea was so awesome that they're like, we got to do this. And uh, so Quebec, or partner of ours in Quebec, opened up the Videotron Center, which is what they hope to play a home of the Nordiques one day. And Metallica is huge in Quebec, and they, so they had Metallica opening the Videotron Center. So we came with an idea, said, let's m recognize this moment for the people of Quebec, where Bud is the number one brand. And uh, we brought a huge tanker from our Montreal brewery to the Videotron Center, and we literally uh, put it in the arena and infused the beer with the music of Metallica, took it back to the brewery, packaged it up in a black can with a certificate of authenticity, and then I got the guys to actually sign cans and put them randomly in case. So that literally people were selling these cases for like $100 on eBay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just a great idea where the Metallica's like, we're going to give a gift back to the people of Quebec who, who love us for some reason. Uh, <laughs> Coulé dans le rock is what I know it as. Uh, and then a funny aside, uh, John, is uh, the agent had me come in and uh, meet the band afterwards. And I didn't know, Lar I, f I got Lars confused with James, so I walked right past Lars. <laughs> and the agent's like, that's it, Lars. So I was like, oh, sorry, how you doing, sir? But uh, it was really good. A example, I think, of an idea that brought the position of the brand, life of the brand to life in a really integrated way uh, that had a big impact on consumers that love Metallica in Quebec. Okay, thanks. And again, last but not least, Kevin. Uh, t t two things come to mind. You know, I, I have a, a, a personal favorite and a professional favorite. The personal favorite first um, was when we sponsored uh, Neil Gallagher from Oasis, his first show in North America as a solo act at the, at the time, the Virgin Mobile Mod Club. And uh, we invited our members to the show and it was a, a well-integrated performance. We actually worked with Bell Media to uh, record the show. Um, and it was a big deal at the time. It was his first show, as I said, in North America in a small underplay. Um, and you know, coincidentally, the manager after that show um, I I enjoyed the recording so much that 
they, he had asked for the recording, um, and it ended up becoming the bonus disc on, I believe, the Noel Gallagher High Flying Birds DVD, which was released in Canada. And it was told that it was taken from the Virgin Mobile Mod Club at the time. So that was a great one for us. And I think professionally, you know, uh, so far, um, we talked earlier about integration and new ideas. Um, the Lady Gaga Monster Ball Tour presented by Virgin Mobile was incredible for our brand. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, not only would she call out um, our members in the show, um, highlight our company, um, particularly because of the Virgin Unite Regeneration Program in Canada that we participated in, which I said uh, supports at-risk youth, and she donated up to $25,000 per night uh, at each of the concerts. So, um, And then for our members, you know, meeting a star at that time, at that scope and that scale, uh, recording that experience and watching them have that emotional connection um, was incredibly powerful too, so it was rewarding. Okay, last question. We'll wi wind up on this and ask you, each of you just to briefly uh, talk about um, what you think, um, you know, to the extent you can share it with us, uh, the brand plans for your particular brands, how that relates to the sort of Toronto music scene and partnerships in the city of Toronto, you know, in the next period of time, like I said, in the short term, because that's what these folks are all interested in. Um, you know, uh, you've been com talking around the point of what you're looking for, but uh, in the immediate future, what might you be looking for? What kind of ideas? What fits in with what you're doing with your brands to the extent you can share that? Andrew? I mean, we're looking for, always looking for people that are active music fans and, you know, whatever size that of audience that looks like. In reality, we're looking for people that, um, that are working with Canadian music and uh, are finding a path to new music fans. So we're looking for partnerships that address that directly. And if we can work with a group of people or individuals that can find new fans that are looking for music, then... We've got the music. Anything history. particularly unique to the Toronto market uh, as distinct from other places in the country? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that there's anything distinct in the Toronto market other than it's the largest potential market for us. So, we're, you know, if you want to use the old cliche fish where the fish are, that's what we're basically doing. Okay. Yeah, we're always on the lookout for partners who um, are really uh, presenting music in an authentic way. Um, I think that's that speaks for a lot of people in this room. Um, you know, we're looking for opportunities to place artists that we work with at the forefront for them, them to gain new fans. Um, you know, that's always something that's going to be a huge thing for us. Uh, and that's definitely a priority in 2017 within Toronto. You know, we want to make sure we're providing amazing moments for these artists. Um, and if we can't do it in their hometown of Toronto, then clearly we're failing. So any support there is obviously appreciated. That's a huge priority for us. Um, we're always going to be looking for support from the city. Um, that's going to be huge as well as a facilitator, as you mentioned. Um, for us to be able to bring these partnerships and some of these activations to life, the city can play a role in that. So anything that the city can do to support is appreciated. Okay, thanks. Amita. Um, we're always looking for new ways that we can support music, and we're always open to exploring that. Um, I'd say really a, a major focus is what I've talked about before, providing youth with access to music or music education, so programs that revolve around that we'd love to chat about. Um, our sponsorship budget in terms of um, music is actually fully allocated for the next few years, but they're also open to hearing about new potential ideas that they can talk about in the future for community. We're, we're available to, to chat and expand um, our po portfolio of giving, so, but really focused a lot on youth and providing youth with access to music. And ladies and gentlemen, this business of the music sponsorship budget being allocated for the next few years, it's probably true, but never let that stand in the way if you think you have a good idea of taking it to them and saying, well, of course, if your budget is fully allocated, we could take it over to RBC or the Bank of Commerce. And <laughs> suddenly you'll find there's adjustments that can be made to the budget. So that was a very interesting comment, and I've heard that when I used to raise money for charity, I'd say, well, that's great, no problem at all. Uh, and we just say, we'll go over to the other charity, bank. Charity, we're all open. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, just thought I'd mention that just in passing, just saying. Uh, Andrew. You're, you're, you're right. Money follows ideas. Um, I mean, we want to be an arm's reach of great music. Uh, I'd say this loud, uh, loudly internally that, you know, unlike sports, that we have sponsorships and there's good years and bad years, music is great every single time. And also, unlike sports, where we've gotten really good at creating consumer value, uh, not necessarily meet needing sponsorship, music's a really difficult nut to crack. You ultimately need to be in the, in the hands of, uh, of the fans. So sponsorship is important in music. And uh, again, I think it's, it's the great part of the news story for us is that music usually is good every single time. You don't have to worry about missing playoffs and, and overpaying for rights fees. So I'd say that's my message today. Anything germane to Toronto in particular, or is that a general message that... <laughs> uh, 
Uh, there might be something, but uh, I would say oh. that we are uh, we're pursuing. We want to be present where great music's happening. There are some things happening that, unfortunately, I, I'm not allowed to say. Not at liberty to discuss it with us, even yeah. if we put the thumb screws yeah. on you. Yeah, no, okay. no. My All budgets right. are committed for the next five years too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same story. Ditto for all that. Don't believe a word of it. Kevin, over to you. Um, you know, the heritage of the brand, um, as I said, is always centered around um, music. So we're, we're always looking for new opportunities, um, particularly those that have scope and scale. Um, as far as Toronto goes, um, this Friday is the uh, iHeartRadio Jingle Ball presented by Virgin Mobile at the Air Canada Centre, which is a sold out show. That's for you, Tyson. Um, and we're extremely excited by that. So, um, you know, when we, anytime we can tie ourselves to an incredible brand, um, a sold out arena show in the city, uh, Canadian talent, again, um, we're open to discussing that. So we're, we're pretty excited about that this Friday. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to say thank you uh, to all of you, uh, Andrew, Brian, Hamida, Andrew, and Kevin. Andrew, Andrew, and Andrew, <laughs> and my other brother Andrew, but I, you, I think you were hopefully very helpful and stimulated some thought. Some of it is on a big scale, but I think you can take those big scale ideas and kind of, you know, scale them down and achieve the same thing and grow it from there, but they were all uh, interesting ideas to hear about, and, uh, and, and I appreciate uh, your honesty, and, and uh, we'll take at face value your comment about the budget being exhausted <laughs> for five years, but don't stop from going to see any of these people if you've got an idea. Ideas, money follows ideas, somebody said, and they were right. I mean, I thank you all very much and appreciate uh, the time you've given and hope you'll be here for the rest of the discussions. I'm just going to do a slight bit of furniture reorganization here while Je and then so Jeffrey can come up. So, uh, have a seat. Um, you have had a, 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 an interesting and varied career. Those are the best kind to have. Um, and, you know, you've been sort of through it all. Independent uh, labels, festival producer, um, you know, now uh, uh, in the uh, carpet city of a uh, big international global uh, music company. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what you see going on here, for starters, in Toronto, um, from where you sit, because it's changing, it's changing rapidly and changing for the better. Um, and just talk a little bit about the, the music scene here first. Oh man, um, what a treat to, to be here, to sit with you, to, to sit with all of you, to share with all of you and talk about uh, the Toronto music community and the Toronto music scene. Um, pretty special what's happening right now. Uh, I go all over the world. I represent sort of brand Canada, particularly brand Toronto, across all genres of music across the, the multiple stakeholders, whether they're artists, producers, uh, management companies, labels, uh, we are seeing Toronto punch. In a category and weight class, someone talked about uh, MMA as a reference before, but in a, in a, in a weight class and category, it's never, had, it's never done before. And it's not so much that uh, something uh, extraordinary is happening, or sorry, something exceptional is happening. It's just that it's extraordinary. And uh, I think this is the new normal of our town. And um, it's pretty special. How's that going to, you know, flow itself out to people here who are from sometimes smaller, more independent organizations? Um, you know, you sit in a different kind of chair now, but you've been at the other places before. How, how's it going to, you know, how do they take advantage of it? H how do they take advantage of that moment in time, that exceptional, um, you know, situation? extraordinary situation that's not exceptional well um, you know I mean the key is that what's happening is that as an entire community I mean events like this help towards it is that you know the entire ecosystem is, is raising up and it's not just sort of uh, you know it's not just Drake although he's been an, an unbelievable ambassador for us but it's it's everyone else around it and so our talent isn't just getting exported raw but is getting actually refined at home and, and that that process involves the entire community, that involves the industry, that involves uh, support, uh, like a, a positive relationship, uh, both public and private, in terms of how the community comes together. That's discussions like this. It's, 
a proactive, favorable relationship with our city in terms of developing the ecosystem around music, which is happening. So a lot of that has to do with the fan experience, and we heard every one of the panelists talk about the members, in the case of Virgil, activations at TD, premium subscribers for Google. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing more with kind of music fans. Um, that fan experience in the 21st century, um, you know, as you look at it now, how has it changed? I mean, talk about that in, in, in the reality of you and dealing with that in the 21st century. So, there may have been a time that a record label was focused on selling recorded music, but the goal primarily is, certainly today, is primarily helping artists connect with fans and potential fans. And somewhere along the way of doing that, monetize something. So, how that happens isn't so important so long as that transaction actually happens. So that involves creating platforms, platforms to help artists connect with fans and potential fans. Um, that comes in the form of, mu of music festivals. That comes uh, in the form of connecting with a partner, like we've heard five sort of iconic world-class brands up here today, um, talking about what they do in music. And so that becomes, w how do we help artists connect with fans and potential fans? And in doing so, um, use any of the available assets to us like other brands, like the folks that were up here today. And uh, talk about a little bit about uh, partnerships, uh, you know, of the kind we heard talked about, and they were talked about under various different categories, sponsorships, partnerships, but a lot of people use the word partnership because they wanted that to characterize what a sponsorship, in fact, would be. Um, you know, what, what role is it, are they playing today? Uh, you know, because we had, as you say, five global brands up here, all of them very interested in and committed to music as one of the vehicles that would drive their business forward. Yeah, I mean, I heard an amazing stat the other day that, like, you know, music is tied with, with movies as the, the number one category for fandom amongst millennials. Uh, that's ahead of sports, that's ahead of fashion, that's ahead of video games. Um, I also heard another uh, incredible statistic that I was surprised to hear is that the sort of over 85% or more of millennials believe uh, that partnering, artists partnering with brands is really important for the artist to develop and sustain a career. So some of the stigmas have dropped down. Um, what was interesting for me in this panel was we heard five amazing brands give five um, kind of vision statements, and there are five very different vision statements. So w when I look at it from the perspective of representing an artist or building an event, uh, whether that's be a festival or a tour, what is the vision, purpose, goal of that artist? How does that relate to the vision, purpose, goal of the brand, and can there be a real connection there? When those connections happen, I think that's when a true partnership happens. So I guess I'm listening to that, and I would, and I, I don't know enough about the business to know, but it, but but that it, it may be less likely that a sort of uh, just getting established, more independent, smaller musician wouldn't necessarily have, have, have thought through, and you're saying it's almost necessary, and I think we heard that from the panelists, to have a bit of a sense of mission for yourself as an artist or for your organization or for the festival you're trying to conceive of as opposed to just going forward and, and have a clear idea of what it is you're trying to be and, 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 and match that up with what they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, all great artists, like that, that process of being a great artist starts when you transcend your influences and you start to figure out who you are and you have a point of view. Um, knowing that point of view will help you communicate with brands uh, to figure out if a partnership is correct or not. You know, I think of kind of middle of the way through developing arts and crafts when um, um, Leslie Feist did a deal with Apple to do um, an iPod commercial. And she turned down a number of other brands because they weren't a fit for her, but that became like a perfect kind of brand alignment. Um, they were releasing, anyway, it just, it made sense. Um, or I can think of with Field Trip, our festival at Fort York, working with uh, TD Bank. And, you know, we wanted to do an, all this programming around um, kids that are coming. We had a couple of thousand kids come to the festival every year. And, um, you know, your budgets are your budgets. So you can only do so much programming uh, based on the, the resources you have. Working with TD in sort of powered all of that kid area, all of our kid zone, and we were able to provide such a deeper, richer experience for festival goers while sort of delivering value for what TD was after.
when you showed up, did you find their budget was completely exhausted for the next five years? <laughs> <laughs> just if you walked in, I'm sort of, oh, no, no, good to see you. Have a seat. Oh, I hope. Yeah. So. Suddenly some money just freed itself up. Well, from your, from your mouth to, to TD's ears. <laughs> so uh, we've got some people here, um, you know, that, and you've been such a contributor to helping us uh, sort of get some of our efforts to uh, put music in the forefront of the city, and I thank you for that. Um, advice to them uh, just about the music scene and you know not necessarily even confined to what we're talking about today which is how to get hooked up with people who can help support you financially and form these partnerships but what advice would you have to offer to the people in this room uh, well I mean you know this room of diverse talented folks but I would say just just launch like uh, you know build develop create release um, you know from when we're looking for artists to work with we look at what they've kind of already done without us. So kind of prove you don't need us and then we'll want to work with you. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and, and look for the partners that make sense for you. You know, like it's, it's an honor when, um, you know, Bell Media or Rogers and one of their radio stations plays one of our, our artists. But um, if you think that's a fit for you, go after it and talk to those brands and see if that see if that makes sense and get to the point where you can get on the Virgin Mobile sponsored iHeartRadio Music Awards. One of the words we hear about and use a lot in the sort of political public realm today is collaboration. Do you think there's enough collaboration between and among people in this room? Because quite often when you have uh, an industry and it has a lot of people who are the sort of independent uh, players, some of them are, are just growing, their inclination is not to cooperate with each other because they think that's going to somehow you know, reduce their ability to get the edge and to be the one that sort of bursts out of the pack and becomes, uh, you know, a much bigger player. But is there is there collaboration that you see, or that, or, or would more be better? Um, more would certainly be better, no question. But I would say that you know, Torontonians, Canadians, uh, the Canadian music sector, working with brand, we're pretty good about partnering on things. You know, I I can remember. Uh, you know, working with our, our beer sponsor for Field Trip and then being open to us bringing craft brews, craft breweries on, realizing that like that would be good a good fan experience that would sort of show their their beer in this sort of collaborative way. Thought, well, that's interesting and collaborative. You know, the work that um, Karis and the Juno Awards are doing, which brings the whole industry together um, with a, a, a partner like Google, um, we all have to work on that. We work on that together. And so I'm seeing it happens in pockets. I think generally people are open to collaboration. More is better. Thank you. I'm just going to say to you on that note, too, that uh, we're finding at the city that the, some of the people you never would have gone to to form partnerships with before on things that are, uh, you know, a bit different, um, if you go and ask. I mean, if you don't ask, it's kind of the point I was making about the, um, and I learned this raising money for charity. Um, if you don't ask, then nobody's ever going to be able to say yes. Um, and, uh, you know, even if you think your idea is a bit wacko, um, take it to one of these people if you sort of think it has the inkling. Uh, and even people you mightn't have thought of as being, you know, these are five global brands, but there's so many businesses that are trying to establish themselves and carve out their niche in this great big city. And, uh, you know, even if you think it's a bit of a wacko idea, um, if you don't ask, you certainly don't get. And, and uh, I think that just fits in with what you just said as well. Um, thank you very much for giving of your time today. Um, I get the hook now, and I think the program's going to carry on with some of the workshops that someone else will explain uh, to you because I couldn't. Um, but uh, I, again, thank you very much for your yeah, time. Yeah, thanks for, for putting this together. Thanks a, a lot. Thanks very much. Thanks.